Hi, I'm Rabita Nagranjit, and today I'm going to talk about our work done in collaboration with EDF Zurich on how to diagnose nanosecond network latency in any host pack. So I'll tell you about the latency diagnosis tool that we built called Insight. We started this work with a question, what causes network latencies within the end host stack? I'm showing you a measurement of memcached message handling latencies within our system. The x-axis shows the 100,000 messages we profiled in order. The y-axis shows the message handling latencies. As you'd expect, most of the memcached messages don't take very long to process, only a few microseconds. But quite a few messages take several milliseconds to process. We wanted to find out why it was taking so long to process these messages. An ideal tool would tell us exactly where those latencies were coming from for each message and give us a holistic picture of the sources of latency anywhere in the stack. This is what this talk is about. We don't have such a tool today. And yet, remarkably, in the last decade, there have been 31 systems that have fixed network latency problems in Edhos. How do we do that without having this holistic view? In every single one of the systems, the authors have made a conjecture. They've painstakingly evaluated the conjecture, in many cases by building their own measurement tooling necessary to do so, and have improved the system. And they've done it all in the blind without having full visibility into how it would interact with other parts of the system or other causes of latency or other end hosts. We as a community have been working in the dark to find the sources of network latencies within the stack. These sources can be anywhere in the end host stack. Here is a cartoon of a network stack. A packet enters the NIC, is processed there, and is then picked up by the NIC driver running on a CPU core. It is then handed to the higher layers of the network stack. And in this process, it can go through multiple queues and will be handed to user space through another queue. As it goes through this pipeline, it can encounter interference anywhere that can slow it down. In the end, it reaches the socket layer after which it is picked up by the application. It is essential to examine this entire pipeline at once to identify why a certain message was delayed. The 31 different systems we have developed this last decade to fix network latencies try to make improvements without having this whole picture. The reason they can't see the whole picture is that every one of these improvements is in a different place in the stack. I've sorted all the systems by where in the pipeline they make measurements and make their improvements. As you can see, the improvements are all over the place. How are we going to know which ones actually matter on a different end host without measuring this entire pipeline? Imagine what we can do if we have a tool that shows all sources of latency all at once. Such a tool must obviously directly and precisely measure the impact of every part of the pipeline on network latencies. And its measurement overhead must be tiny, so we can actually turn it on and measure the entire stack. I'm going to tell you how we can build such a tool. There are three important things we must do. Collect profiling data, have a system that analyzes this data, and then presence visualizations so, so the user can do something with them. The rest of this talk is about these three aspects of building the diagnostic tool. Let's talk about profiling. There are four problems we encountered when building the profiling tool. And I'm gonna talk about each one of these problems in turn. First, we wanna examine the entire pipeline, but most profiling tools miss parts of the pipeline. We don't have tools that will directly and precisely measure network latencies due to the NIC host interface, head of line blocking or interference. In order to examine the entire pipeline at once, we must track all system activity a message encounters between the NIC and the application. So we must start recording message lifetimes as they enter the end host, either at the NIC as, the, as shown here or at the application and determine how much time they spent at each step. As they go through the stack and queues, as they wait behind interference, and until they finally exit the stack. 
If we do so, we'll see the complete system activity that is responsible for the messages network latency. And that's what's, what makes it possible to detect the reasons for network latency deviations. For example, we'll be able to tell that this particular message was delayed because it encountered queuing or head of line blocking and interference by comparing its lifetime to a typical message lifetime that did not encounter these problems. A second problem with profiling is that even for the parts of the pipeline that we do have a tool for, the tools have very high overhead, so we can't turn them on everywhere at once. And this problem only gets more difficult as systems get faster and faster, and performance approaches the microsecond regime. We have less and less time to do any data collection. We measure the latency overheads added by existing tools to memcached messages at the end host stack. This graph shows the CDF of memcached message handling latencies with and without profiling. Compared to the baseline, by turning on these tools even for a single point in the pipeline, we substantially perturb the measurement, noticing log scale in the x-axis. EBPF1 is already noisy when measuring one function. When we measure multiple functions, noise is an order of magnitude above the signal. To add to the problem, these tools are adding variable latencies to different messages, and these latencies look like true latency deviations. On the other hand, look at the curve for Intel PT, a CPU hardware profiler. That more or less doesn't disturb the curve at all. And in fact, when we use CPU hardware profiling with Insight, we get equally non-invasive measurements. To top that, the CPU hardware profiler also tracks any deviations that we introduce. So there is no ambiguity in diagnosis as to where the network latencies are coming from, whether from the stack or from the profiling tool. So far, I've given you only half the picture of profiling. CPU hardware profiling measures elapsed function call times on course, but does not relate to messages at all. This might be surprising. We're used to profiling application programs where a request arrives and following the call stack or processing helps us see how the request was processed in the stack. But in end host network stacks, function invocations seen with CPU profiling are substantially decoupled from network messages. The fine grained function information from CPU profiling only helps identify system activity within a time span. We add to that additional per message timestamps that lets us associate hardware profiling information with particular messages. This is the first step to building a message profile. We must then align the message profile timelines with CPU profiling timelines to accurately construct the message lifetime and measure the latencies the message encounter in every part of the stack. In the end, we need one coherent message timeline. One challenge is that the NIC clock and software clocks used to collect message profiles are different from the CPU profiling clock. We need annotations to keep track of the relationship between the clocks. To add insult to injury, the way most operating systems manage clock synchronization is by changing the clock we are using for message measurement. To get to a single message type lifetime, we need to compensate for such tampering. This is one practical problem that Insight has to contend with before we can build a real system. You can read the paper to find out how we solve this problem, but with Graham, the clock synchronization work presented earlier today, this problem can possibly be remedied more elegantly. That brings me to the final challenge we have to solve for profiling, that is tracking messages across course. The operating system does not help track the passage of messages across course. So we can't actually tell which system activity on the course impacted message lifetimes unless we track this information. What we need to do is gather an additional timestamp and core information at message processing boundaries between the kernel and the application. When we do so, we are able to track not only system activity, but also cross message interference, head of line blocking because we know all messages that were processed by every core within the span of message lifetimes. We collect all three timestamps for each message using the socket library. We can extend insight for stacks that do not use sockets by collecting the timestamps together with the metadata for each message. And that is the second half of profiling. 
With all of this information, we can reconstruct message lifetimes for all messages during the profiling period. We're going to capture some messages with typical lifetimes and some with anomalous lifetimes. And since our goal is to understand the causes of the anomalies, we need to compare the anomalous lifetimes to the typical lifetimes to understand what is different about them. That brings me to the next challenge with analysis. How to diagnose the cause of deviations. We want to assign latency deviations to the functions that cause them. Here, we're going to focus on deviations caused by head line blocking. I'll be showing you the call stack associated with the message lifetime that experienced head line blocking. In CPU profiling, when you want to find the functions responsible for latency deviations, there is one trace where we spend all our time. But for finding the causes of latency deviations in anomalous messages, we're asking, how is it different from a typical lifetime? In this particular example, there was head line blocking because there was already some other message in the kernel's queue. The kernel had to process this other message. In a typical lifetime, you don't see another message getting processed. You only see the one message getting processed. Then the same thing happened to Memcached. Memcached was busy handling some other message in this entire subtrace. This subtrace doesn't appear in the typical trace because we go right to doing the work we need to do with just one message. When Memcached finally gets to processing the message whose lifetime we are analyzing, for some other reason deeper in the stack that I'm not shown here, TCP received message takes longer than in a typical trace. It'll be much shorter in a typical trace. Once we have this understanding, we then identify the subset of functions in these traces that actually cause the deviation. We have described how we achieved this in the paper. So that concludes the analysis step and brings us to the visualization step. We used inside visualizations to identify the causes of Mentashi tail agencies in our system. And this is what Insight came up with. Head of line blocking was the most pervasive cause of Memcached latencies. Presenting causes like head of line blocking is difficult without a new visualization. We introduced the Matryoshka plot for this purpose. Here is how it works. Along the horizontal axis is the lifetime of the message and the functions or events that participated in handling it. Each of those functions is drawn as a square because on the vertical axis, you can see how long it takes. It essentially acts like a bar graph where the functions in which the message spent a bunch of time stand out. The vertical axis also shows the nesting of functions clearly. On the horizontal axis, the same functions are ordered with respect to other functions. This ordering helps identify the sequence of events in the message timeline. Together, the nesting and the ordering information tell us what underlying events caused anomalous functions to be expensive. You can very quickly decide, do I want to look at the outer function because it is so important and took so much time, or do I want to look at the inner one because it is causing the outer deviation? You can find more details in the paper. Now I've overlaid annotations on this plot to make it easy to tell what is happening in the zoomed out Matryoshka plot. The entire span of time marked head of line blocking is the part where Memcached is processing a previous message that is queued up. It receives the old message, handles that message, and sends back a reply before receiving the next message. We changed our system configuration to mitigate the causes of latency shown by Ensight. We then profiled our system again with Ensight. And we saw that the absolute worst tail latencies had reduced from 15 milliseconds to 2 milliseconds. We also saw far fewer outliers. Only a handful of initial messages and a burst of messages in the middle experienced millisecond message handling latencies. You also do not see any outliers due to the previous causes of tail latencies. When we look at the Matryoshka plot for these initial messages, the reason for the delay stands out. There is a large scheduling delay before memcached connection setup is completed, which we were able to remedy in the next step. After correcting for these remaining causes shown by Ensight, we noticed that we were left with a few outliers in the startup phase, but they were not due to connection setup. The worst tails were now in the 300 microsecond range. And that is the story of how Ensight helped us configure our system to mitigate Metcache tail latencies. We ran through three iterations and configurations, 
The seeding of plots of Menkashi latencies show how the tail dropped with each iteration. Notice again how the horizontal axis is in log scale. The right side zooms into the 90th percentile and higher latencies. We also notice that our mitigations increase latencies of messages around the 25th percentile. To understand why, we compare the message lifetimes around the 25th percentile observed across these two profiling iterations. When we did that, Insight showed how the resource usage of process context in these message lifetimes differ across the two iterations. We noticed that memcached in red had only two cores to run on in the third iteration, compared to three in the initial iteration shown on the left. In addition, a core that received messages in the third iteration, the one in blue on the right, was ideal most of the time and needed to be woken up before receiving the 25th percentile messages. These two reasons cause the increase in the latencies in the third iteration. You can find more details in the paper. This story shows you the power of Ensign. It can be used to diagnose latency increases anywhere in the latency distribution, not just the tail. So with that, hopefully I've convinced you that there is a way to diagnose network latencies even in the microsecond regime and shown you the power of Ensign a tool that shows you all sources of network latency in Enfos all at once. We're going to be making Insight available as open source. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me at this email. I also want to thank John Harbour for helping us in this journey by helping us tell the story. Thank you.